all of your personal <laughs> state. Hello, hello. Thanks everyone for being here for this important conversation. I'm Vicki, I am the GM of the studio that creates the branded content for MyCode, which is a media platform that allows advertisers to invest in minority owned and led publishers, creators, and producers. It's kind of the best thing in the world. My whole career has been leading up to, to this because I'm very committed to DE&I, I'm very committed to culture and telling authentic stories. Um, today we're going to talk about how DE&I and brand authenticity work together. Uh, they're very broad terms. I'm sure all of us could define them in 20 different ways. Um, and, they, and they have changed, you know, from, from the inception of the phrases, they've changed multiple times. Uh, I would love for each of you to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you do professionally and then maybe if you can share a moment where a brand made you feel seen, we can start to dive into how authenticity works for brands. Tulani, do you want to start? Uh, for sure. Hi, y'all. My name is Tulani Elisa. Um, I work on Global Social at Prime Video and I'm very excited to be here with y'all. Um, a time a brand has made me feel seen. I think um, being an athlete my whole life and playing basketball in college and going through what everyone goes through is changing how much you're doing and where you are and all of those things. Um, I think Nike and the campaign they've been running over the past, past few years of just more inclusivity of like not just types of body but types of people and types of ways that you use your body. Um, I always, you know, see their stuff and really feel like it's messaging, it's something that I actually connect with, which is, as we'll probably talk about, pretty hard to do uh, with brands, so I would say that. Wonderful. Um, Toy? Hi, my name is Toy. I'm over at PayPal and I manage impact partnerships and marketing. And so when we think about our mission, vision and values and how we partner with various organizations and entities to ensure that we are prioritizing one of our core values, which is, in, is inclusion, that's my space. Um, I would say one of the earlier brands for me, um, and I'm probably aging myself because I don't even know if the show is on anymore, but um, Sesame Street. Because I feel like at an early age, you saw diversity when it wasn't in. So they didn't really talk about it, but you were seeing images that looked like you, right? Um, even in the puppets. Um, so I, I think um, I would say that is a brand that has been um, tried and true over the years as it relates to diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging. everyone, uh, Vivian Chang, I lead direct to consumer at Clorox, uh, yes, the cleaning brand, and essentially my team uh, launches e-commerce transaction capabilities and grows uh, these programs through performance marketing, CRM, um, data optimization, and so forth. Um, so I think for me, kind of an interesting reaction to when you ask the question about like brands that resonate, I guess being in the hyphen space of Asian American, I actually don't love brands that just put, call it like Asian women in their imagery because I feel like it's inauthentic. Um, my hope is, call it younger generations gonna grow up where it's very natural and they don't even have a second thought about it, but that's you know, still my initial reaction a lot of times. And so I think brands that resonate to me, it's more about the values. I love being outdoors, so brands like Patagonia, who also stands for like democracy, um, or just generally like women-founded brands. That's really interesting. Um... I, I don't have a brand that did that for me, but as a, as a biracial person, mm -hmm. I think like the first time I saw a, a white woman and a black man together on TV as a couple, I was like, oh, holy shit, they know. 
like if somebody said something, <laughs> you know. Um, and I and I think like uh, as we watch brands evolve, um, Toy, I think you and I spoke about the Hallmark Channel. I don't know if any of y'all watched that, but. <laughs> If you've watched over the last five years, it's been such a change, and they really are making strides in inclusivity. Um, and they somehow continue to get me to come back and watch these movies. So, like, how do you start to build that connection, that authentic connection with the consumer? So you and I talked about this, um, and this is something that I believe personally and professionally, I think as brands, we've got to stop renting the culture um, and really dig into our consumer insights and lead with multicultural marketing. Oftentimes, multicultural marketing is the secondary, and as soon as there are budget cuts, the budgets for the multicultural marketing go out the window. And I think that will be problematic as we see globalization just hitting us in a way that we've never seen in the past. So to your point, um, it's not about having, you know, the Asian woman in there during, you know, uh, Asian Pacific Heritage Month or the black woman in there on uh, during um, African American History Month. But it's about, like, how do we start to exist in a way that makes sure that our campaigns are representative of our customer base? It's a non no ah, sorry. It is a non-negotiable to operate in any other capacity. So, so Lonnie, if you have, um, you talked a little bit about building that authentic connection on social and that being kind of the place to do it. I would love to hear more about that and how you think, uh, how you approach building that connection now that there is so much communication between the con consumer and the brand. Yeah, I think that um, kind of what Toy was saying, but to, to build on it and kind of how you felt when you saw that couple on TV, it's really about knowing your audience. Like, who's actually watching? What other things do they do besides engage with my social media post or watch the show? What are the things that are important? And, and how is the landscape of that demographic and of our country changing? And then how do we make sure to respond to that? And it's really the same thing with social media. Who's listening? Who are we hoping to reach? And you're always going to have like the audience you really want to reach, but it's also important to pay attention to who's engaging right now. What age are they? Where do they live? What are their values? And then how do we create strategies that speaks to the things that they're interested in in an authentic way? And a way to do that is by not just you know posting a picture, but following up with the movie of you know the interracial couple or an all-black family or something that actually shows that they've put time and money behind not really you know just posting something on social but every social strategy really has the backing of good content and a commitment to who we're saying we're supporting um, and that really is what goes into the thinking of any strategy is what is the authentic voice we're going to take on on social how are we backing it up within our company and then how do we execute in a way that's going to make people want to engage I think for social for us where like obviously you're creating original content so you can think about very specific audiences that you're targeting for like CPG where it's somewhat generic products right like a Clorox bleach can you know applies for everyone um, for us on social it's more about uh, moving away from the traditional audience segmentation that was like fairly broad and treating that all as one kind of homogeneous group and we're really leveraging the power of influencers and content creators to speak to their own small communities and how does bleach fit into their cleaning lifestyle how are they you know finding innovative ways and in amplifying their platform I think for us as an old legacy brand we're not really trying to recreate the wheel and try to come up with you know our own original messaging to go after like a multicultural millennial when there are so many voices out there that already love the product how do we just piggyback off of that yeah I, I think that leads to one of the other questions and something that I always struggle with 
um, is this idea of, you know, the monolith. Um, communities as monoliths. Uh, it's, it's the same uh, as having a month for <laughs> a culture to celebrate in. Um, it, it pegs you into this hole. So one of the things that uh, I love the idea of using other people to tell that story and allowing them as their whole selves to align in their own authentic way. But I also like the idea of aligning with interests to kind of avoid um, talking to everyone in the same way, assuming that every black person thinks the same way about a certain type of brand. Um, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on, on those things. So I think at the core is trust. That's what I'm hearing. Whether it's about influencers or whether it's about interests, it's about how are you making sure that people trust the brand and they trust an authentic brand. And so when I think about it, and I always joke about it, some people will get it, some may not, you'll get it later. But um, culturally, if you've ever been to a, a family reunion um, of primarily black folks, people will ask, well, who made the potato salad? And if they don't know who made the potato salad, they're like, no, nah, I'm good. Aunt such and such didn't make it. No, nah, I'm going to pass. That boils down to trust. And when you have that trust, you, that's where you can get adoption. That's where you can get um, uh, loyalty. So when I think about the Clorox uh, wipes, and I'm sure you all had tons of great memes during the pandemic. Who out there was like wishing you had a Clorox? I mean, you were going, you were even willing to take the lemon, right? Uh, Why? I, I was Clorox millionaire. <laughs> exactly. Everybody was calling me because my exactly. father-in-law is a Clorox wholesaler. Exactly. I had a tower of Clorox at my house, and everyone who knew me was calling for exactly. a favor. Exactly. We wanted no other brand, right? And that is because we trusted Clorox was going to get it cleaner than anyone else and so I think at the core is how are you building trust with your audience in a way that is authentic so if she never did another campaign on Clorox wipes it's okay because we all walked away feeling like if I don't have Clorox wipes it's just not clean they built trust and I think more brands have to be committed to building trust whether it's with women or the black community or even like I just had a, a conversation this year where um, they asked me about uh, some images. And I said, um, okay, so I'll look through some images for a, a rebrand. And it was a black father, his black son, playing basketball. And I said, wow, it just feels so cliche. You know, how do we create a different experience and get away from stereotypes? Maybe the father could tutor his son. Okay, well, what about if we had the son and the father playing soccer? Get away from sports. <laughs> you know what I mean? How do we think about the LGBTQ plus community in a way that's not just social? It's not just the party. It's not just a group of friends out. How do we start to tell the domestic story? That is authentic, and that is how, that is how brands, we can start to build trust. So. Um, I think to your question about the monolith part of it, I think there's two things. One, I hear what you're saying about like aligning on interests socially and in general that can be tough, right? Because it's a really broad spectrum of like trying to grab people just based on like certain things that they like. And whether we like it or not, a lot of people still do play identity politics, right? Especially in entertainment. Um, you know, everyone doesn't always watch the same thing, but like as a black person, you're gonna give something a shot if there's black people in it because you're like, well, I gotta support, right? And so I think when I, when I always say, you know, to people on my team is like, we can't boil the ocean, right? Like we can't try and be everything to everybody or every type of person that might be interested in what we're doing. And so sometimes it benefits you to focus on the group that is, you know, in the space that you're working in at that time. And that's how marketing campaigns become buried by social platform or what you're seeing on TV or what you're seeing on a billboard or what you're seeing in real life and you get people at 
different stages or people that maybe experience things different that might have a connection but might not just have it the, the way that you're presenting it maybe on one platform but see themselves in a different way on another platform. Um, it's almost like, you know, <laughs> what Joy was saying, it's like there might be like a, a group of, you know, families that like would rather see themselves partying and then cleaning up with Clorox afterwards than to see themselves, you know, in a different situation. But in another place, maybe it's that same family, you know, at home having dinner and cleaning up afterwards. So I think it's really the challenges on us of like not even just thinking about the monolith part of it, but like how do we do a better job of really speaking in the right places to these groups of people? back to your, again, the model S piece, like an opportunity. And honestly, I don't see a whole lot of brands doing this. And I'd say we're guilty of it too, is really utilizing tactically your CRM platforms to communicate in a more one-to-one -one basis that involves a ton more content and really deep insights and you know, people who can actually write in a tone and messaging that's authentic. But I think there's so much opportunity there. Like so, a lot of the conversations I hear about um, targeting mi minorities or um, DNI, it's assuming like mass communication and advertising and TV campaigns. And I feel like we're completely ignoring a true one-to-one -one channel in a lot of these right now. Um, yeah, we we spoke. I think each of us spoke at some point on the importance of of data and this two-way communication between your consumer and the brand. Um, I'm curious to know how internal D&I efforts help to facilitate that type of two-way conversation. Um, I always, New York Subway, notorious for some of the worst advertising in the world. You can tell somebody in Kentucky wrote something that you're supposed to like, oh, somebody's touching your shoulder on the train, wah, 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 and you're supposed to be like, oh my God, they get me. They ride the train too. And um, I just feel like there is, you can tell when there's a lack of communication between you and your consumer. You can tell when someone who has not done any research or talked to anyone of the culture, of the community, of the neighborhood that you're trying to speak to if they didn't do the work. So like, how do D&I efforts internally contribute to creating an authentic two-way communication with your consumer? You're looking at me, so I'll just say, <clears throat> I'll start with, I don't know that anyone has like knocked it out of the park as it relates to internal DNI efforts. I think there's great intention, but I think we still have a lot of work to do. I think we started to turn the corner, you know, in the, amidst the pandemic and the things that happened with George Floyd. Um, I think we started to see uh, brands show up very differently. Hopefully it was not just a moment, but it is actually going to be a movement. Um, and what I hope is that more brands will move in the direction of when we think about our customer base, we making sure that internally the way that we are you know rolling out DNI efforts they are reflective of our customer base so our our employee base should look like our customer base and there should be these um, environments where we can have real dialogue about the differences in cultures so that we aren't having these situations where brands are going out prematurely and then they're getting canceled because cancel culture is real and as marketers we have to pivot very quickly when these types of initiatives take off so I would just say um, I think it's important that corporations start to double down on their DNI efforts in a way that feels like there's conviction across like whether it's their marketing and brand and or their internal work, that consistency is going to be critically important. I just want to underline what you said of making sure your own employee base looks like your consumers, right? Um, we have, and not even just from like D&I, for some of our brands, we'll have like 
50 year old white men trying to evaluate like social influencer posts and it, you know, is that gonna no it's no wonder those land flat right like they don't they're not innate and in those systems they don't understand TikTok and so forth and so it's just like it's very obvious but I think we still have a long way to go of just like how about bringing in the actual like Gen Zer that you want to target to create that content and they actually care about it and they live and breathe it and it's the same way I think with all of the um, you know multicultural millennial targeting and so forth have you um, have you been been able to see the impact of, of any of your internal efforts on the um, on the communication that you have with the consumer have you seen like specific things happen and that's for anyone <laughs> oh. again I think we're collectively many companies I'll just say it broadly are starting to turn a corner because we had no choice in the midst of the pandemic we all had to we were just like we had a ton of time and D-Nice could only get us so far <laughs> but, but we had to really double down on this because I think employers or employees rather were saying like listen this is a non-negotiable like as a company to your point it's the right thing to do um, and then as marketers if we're not doing Doing it, I don't know that you can be successful if you're continuing to operate in this kind of monolithic um, lens around touching people and audiences that you want to connect. I mean, I, I brought up the example of Band-Aid. I don't know if they had already planned it, but I now, I'm 48 years old. It took 40 plus years to get a Band-Aid. That's my flesh tone. Like, Come on already, you know what I mean? Like I am not nude, this is not a nude skin tone. So like that small thing, I said I'm willing to play a premium just because I'm so excited that the, there's a Band-Aid that matches my skin tone. Th those are small things, but it took a George Floyd moment to actually come to life. I think that's, that's kind of what I was thinking of. I think people are reacting, some of them faster than others, but I do think sometimes the quick reactions is where you get into that inauthenticity and the performative part of what people are doing. So um, some of it's gonna take time and some of it you honestly want to take time because you don't wanna see what people will come up with when they you know, bring in a few people of color from a certain culture and they're like, what do we do today? And then, you know, ban they puts out band-aids that a bunch of other companies have been doing for years so like there's I think it's it's having a little bit of like okay this is it's late but people are doing it but I think as brands saying even if it means taking a little bit more time how do we do this authentically how do we make sure we're not just posting but we're executing in other ways or we're hiring in other ways or we're creating content in other ways that actually speaks to it and it's a holistic approach to being authentic and to seeing broader groups of people and, and meeting them where they are. And so I think some of it too is like, it's going to take some time, but as long as you're working towards it, that's where the authenticity authenticity comes in. Because you, I mean, it's worse, especially social-wise, when when you don't take all the steps and and get the learning and and learn what you don't know about these cultures and the moments that you need to pay attention to. Yeah, I've got two examples. One actually really tied into what you're just talking about. Um, Actually, for a lot of the Clorox brands in the midst of kind of the COVID, the George Floyd moments, uh, we chose not to say anything. And it was really just like, we don't really have the folks internally where we felt like we could you know, put out a, a message that we're comfortable with that actually adds value to the conversation that's happening. And so on social and different platforms, we just stayed silent and let other voices take the stage. And and there was a lot of debate on, you know, you could get called out as a brand of doing that as well. But, you know, I think it's to your point of sometimes taking it slow is better than rushing to get something out there. Um, so, you know, I think that was an interesting way of thinking about showing up by actually not saying something as a brand. 
my, my other example of like where DEI internal efforts are actually helping, I think it's helping legacy brands like ours take risks in this space. And so Clorox and Teva Wipes actually did a TikTok partnership with Billy Porter and he created this whole jingle around like, um, like yes, clean. It's really fun. Um, but a couple years ago, this never would have gotten approved. And I think it's because there's enough folks internally that were able to validate that, like, yes, this is on brand, it's the tone is right, and it, you know, it got executives willing to run the campaign. I have, I have this is the second to last question. Um, and I don't know if we're going to get an answer because I, I definitely don't know one. Um, when you are working in a company and there are people selling a product to a community that is not theirs um, or speaking to a community that is not that they're not part of how do you set them up for success this comes from me thinking about the idea of people of color and disenfranchised peoples always having to educate and I know that DE and I efforts do a lot of good work, but sometimes there's people are still uncomfortable. People don't want to. I don't want to act like I know that. Like, how do I? But I still have to sell it. So how do how do you set your teams up for success in that instance? I think I'm just going to go back to truth and trust, right? Um, ideally, when leading a team, you want to build trust in the team, and as it relates to brand and marketing, you want to make sure that people have that um, platform and opportunity to speak up if there are some concerns. Um, I think one of the one of the um, shining moments as a marketing leader was when um, one of my white female team members said, um, "This feels very vanilla." about a campaign that we were working through. And to me, that was huge, because you never would see that in the past. People would just let it go forward. So for me, that felt like success. And I think creating an environment where people can say, mm, this isn't landing well for me, because we should be digging into why, let's unpack it. Um, and I feel like more, I'm hearing from more of my friends in marketing that that platform and opportunity is there much more than it was five or ten years ago. People are comfortable saying, are we sure this is the right approach? You know, culturally, do we think we might be, um, like I said, renting the culture or bastardizing the culture? And so it's about when people do raise that red flag or that amber flag, how are we addressing it? Meaning, what type of culture have we created amongst the team to have those discussions and to be ready to say, hey, let's walk away. This isn't the right way. I think it is first admitting what you don't know. I think a lot of times as marketers we're like, we got this. I can I can talk to this person. I've seen this or I've seen how this is done. Um, I think it's being honest with yourself, with the team, that if you're not able to build a team that can speak to the audience you're hoping to connect with, you can work with a team that does it all the time, right? So being honest of what you don't know and then asking for help. There are black owned agencies. There are agencies that only focus on connecting with Latina audiences like there are so many groups out there that are doing this 24 7 and I mean yes there's always progress that can made, be made internally but a big part of you know being a marketer is knowing your limit knowing what you know and then getting that opinion or help or experience from somewhere else and it can be for a full campaign or it can be for research or it can be for education like it doesn't have to fall on you know the one Asian person in your team or you know the one person that identifies as differently there's whole companies that do this all the time but that's what comes back to that authenticity and commitment to being authentic are you willing to spend the money are you willing to talk to people that you maybe 
you know, didn't even know their company existed before? Are you willing to, you know, bring the right people in, partner with the right groups, um, and kind of get away from the ego of I know everything to there's things I don't know and I'm going to ask for help to make this 10 times as good as it could be. Um, and so I think a big part of that is looking for those, and again, is another part of being part of the commitment. Look for the small groups, organizations, companies that are black-led, that are, um, you know, Asian-led, that are LBGTQIA+, and say, hey, let's bring you into the fold. Let's have a conversation. And can you work with us as an agency on this? We need these things. That's an opportunity that you're providing to a group that you've said is important. And that's also educating the people that work with you. So I think that is probably one of the best ways that I, I've seen. The only thing I would add there, because oftentimes that's the consumer insights, this is where the budgets get cut. It's like, well, can't we just use some others? You know, and so to your point, just building on that, making sure that you're padding your budgets for that insights that she just referenced. I think small things, but something I try to remember is we have had people who have raised their hands to say like, yeah, I'm going to be the multicultural lead for cleaning or whatever else. Um, but checking in with the actual person, because it is a bit of a burden and it's not always like, you know, she, I didn't think of this individual, like she and I actually bond because we talk about driving change within a legacy CPG company from different contexts, right? I'm doing it from digital transformation. She's doing it on targeting, but just like, you know, same as what, how we would um, anyone, but looking for opportunities for that person to have a platform to speak or to present something, recognizing that like, hey, you know, how are you just generally doing? I think it's like, it is a really tough role internally. Um, and so, you know, I think like not forgetting about the people internally who are driving that agenda. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I just want to know if you have one big message that you want to leave uh, the, the, the group with. What do you want them to walk away resonating in their mind? <laughs> I think from my side, it's driving any kind of change, and especially this, a lot of this is about changing cultures within the companies, marketing approaches. It's a journey, and it takes time. And just recognize, you know, taking that step back and recognizing the progress, because it's easy to get disappointed in the day to days. Um, I would say. Don't be afraid to be the person that speaks up, regardless of your race or gender or whatever. Don't be the person that's afraid to speak up when something doesn't seem right. Even if you think you're not the person to speak on a certain collection of people, if you're the person in the room, or if you know the other person that maybe identifies with that seems like they are not comfortable speaking up, that's where authenticity comes from, is the people in the company saying, okay, we've also committed to this as people, as a company, and when something's not right, or when something is right, or when you really think something needs to be changed, whether you identify with it or not, it's really about being willing to speak up, because that's how the change then like permeates through everything else that's being done. Because someone is questioning things that maybe a company has always done or a way that they've always done something. And what we're finding now in every facet of marketing and social is the way we've always done it doesn't work. So what can you as an individual do that's different? So co-sign on both of these, both of the remarks. And I would just add, um, as marketers, like, let's keep the humanity in marketing, right? And just take a human-centric approach to how we think about our strategies, how we think about our consumer insights and our outcomes. Um, and I think if we did that, we would find that we're going to see more and more exciting and inclusive and representative um, brand campaigns. Thank you. What I heard from this was my motto that I live by, and we've been hearing it over and over all day from various groups, said in many different ways, but it comes down to you can't 
try to be something to everyone, find your people, know them well, speak to them in a way that resonates with them and they will be your voice and they will bring you new people. That's what I'm taking away from it. Be the change. Do we have questions from the audience? Aha, I knew you would have a question. Thank you. Um, I loved hearing all of your perspectives, and I think one of the commonalities is, and you've all said it different ways, it's getting to the understanding of what's behind the what you're looking to portray, so the, the why. For example, I work for a youth sports platform, and I do brand advertising. And when you mentioned, you know, like the, the black father playing soccer with his child, you know, that is a generic image. But if they were able to articulate back to you, well, sports is actually, a youth, we use sports to teach these life lessons. And, you know, my son is a, he's an introvert and he's a little bit of a misanthrope. So I need to get him, you know, associated with other people. And this is the tool that I use to use it. Or my daughter, you know, needs to develop confidence and know that she has a voice. And I use sports in order to help her do that. So I think what you all are saying is that, you know, you need to understand the why behind it and just don't take things for face value. And I love that message because it really gets people thinking and it's, that's how it becomes authentic when you know that. So I appreciate that. Always with the insights. Thank you for sharing your experience and stories. My name is Ashley Cartwright, and I love what you mentioned about putting your money where your mouth is and staying committed beyond what the expectation or surface level of media reach and impressions and goals are. And so question for you all in terms of how you're thinking about it, your companies or any insight into how we get leadership, executives, people beyond the current measurable metric of what success is for the audience because it is something you have to double down on and play the long game for to prove that you are authentic and it's not just a check we did it so i'm just curious like what are some of the things you guys are doing to achieve that well i'll just start really quickly um i think you mentioned it best when you said you know it's um it's not something that we can, uh, it, it didn't take us overnight to get here, so it's going to take us time. So really being able to um, start in a way that one is rooted in consumer insights, I think is really helpful. Um, also trends are very helpful. And, and being able to tell the business case as to why um, this maybe pivoted value proposition will work. Um, I think more and more leaders are understanding that if you're not representative and you're not showing up in an inclusive manner, people are taking their dollars elsewhere. So I think all of these things make up a very strong business case around why it's it's, it's not an option. It's, it's essential. So. I will say very quickly, because I actually have to run, but we have an event tonight. Um, What's important, and I think you were talking a little bit internally, is that if we know it's a process, then not trying to compare the brand new thing that we did for a niche group or an emerging audience or you know someone we haven't always been talking to, to like the big campaign we did for the people we know love us. That goes for brands, for television, for anything else. How are you, it's, it's not apples to apples, right? So how are you creating your own benchmark for those new ways that you're trying to connect with people? How are you making sure that people aren't saying, well, we featured all of these XYZ people, but didn't do as well as the regular stuff we know, right? It's changing your mentality about what success is, and that starts within by saying, okay, success for a campaign that we're trying to reach or hit a new audience with or speak to a new group with, maybe we set a bar after we've done a few of them, and and compare it against something that really tells a story instead of saying like, oh, we spent all the money, it didn't do great, like cancel it, get rid of it, like whatever it might be. What are the things that you're, again, internally, mentally, men like your mentality you're changing to change what success is when you're trying, you know, new and different things at your company? Managing expectations. We have one more question. 
I'm Mika Smith-Brown with Airbnb. I appreciate hearing from you all. My question is, when you are on this path, you have a strategy, but you're social listening and your consumers let you know you made a wrong move. How do you authentically address that? Do you address that? Do you ignore it and just move forward with your strategy? I'll say quickly, social, like, it's it's the best way to immediately know what's going on, and it's the best way to adjust, and it doesn't mean every comment you see that's like, Airbnb did a terrible, like, no, we're not going to switch the whole strategy because of that, but when you're looking at those analytics, and, and someone that's like, tagging content for you, making sure they're really looking at, like, what themes or types of things are, are or, or not resonating, and then how do we answer Amplify the things that are and the things that aren't. What's the switch? What are people saying? You know, we have, you know, I said um, earlier to Vicky that like we've gone back to the days of mom and pop stores, right? Where people are telling you right away how they feel. And if someone told like your local butcher like this meat was terrible and everyone's coming and saying it, you're not gonna be like, well, like you're gonna change it and you're gonna find like that tweak. So I think it's like knowing that it's the internet, so it's volatile, there's a lot of things going on and you're not gonna please everyone, but paying attention to those trends and taking action where you can be impactful um, because not everyone's gonna love you. That's that's just the bottom line for, for brands and people, but if you believe in it and you're also listening and making changes, that's really you know the best you can do. Words to live by. Not everyone will love you. Thank you, ladies. Much appreciated. You did great.